getting a little nervous, so bear with me. Thank you, Pastor, for giving me the opportunity to preach. Um, thank you, my family, for coming. My family loves me. They come just about every time I preach. They try their best to make it. My family is my rock. They, they help me. They encourage me. They love me. And I, I really do thank each and every one of you for being here. Um, even with the little babies and with not feeling so well sometimes, they try their best to encourage me. And, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for giving the opportunity to preach. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. I'm going to teach a little something to you for a minute, and then I'm going to preach to you why I'm so passionate about this. Um, I've preached this sermon once before, and it wasn't my plan tonight, but uh, God sometimes has a different idea than we do. And as Pastor said, it's God's will, not ours. It's not by my might nor my strength, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> We're going to be, begin reading in verse number 10 of Ephesians chapter number 6. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to preach. God, I pray that you would make me disappear and empty me completely. Humble me, Lord. Forgive me for the times I failed you. Forgive me for being a hypocrite, Father. I thank you for the opportunity you've given me. I pray that you would fill me right now. Anoint me with fresh oil, God. Fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. If there's one person in here tonight that needs what is going to be said, God, I pray that you would speak through me and make me disappear completely. God, I am nothing without you. I pray that this would be in your power and your might. It's in your sense, perfect and precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to teach to you for a minute in Ephesians chapter number six, which shouldn't be that difficult because just a couple weeks ago we had an evangelist come in, Brother Randy Bain, and he preached on this passage and he stayed solemnly in this passage. I'm going to teach you a little something and then I'm going to try to preach to you for a minute on why I'm so passionate about it. What I am here to do tonight is to recruit you for the fight. I am here to recruit you for the spiritual battle that we're in in this day. And then I'm going to explain to you why it is so worth serving the Lord. Why it is so encouraging and it is so worth it in the end to follow the Lord and to serve the Lord. In Ephesians chapter number 6, I'm going to say if you're going to join this fight, there are a few things you have to realize. Verse number 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you're going to join this spiritual fight with us, you need to realize that this is not a fleshly fight. It has nothing to do with your strength physically. It has nothing to do with your looks. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. It has nothing to do with how much knowledge you have in your head, how smart you are, how high you think your IQ is. This is strictly spiritual, and it is strictly a fight in the spirit world that I'm talking about. God says, put on the whole armor of God. Why is it that we need to be in God's power? Well, it tells us here in the next verse, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is something that we cannot control in our flesh. I'm telling you, this is something that we must have the Lord's might for us. We must be all in in this fight. I'm asking you today to either sign up for the first time, to re-enlist, and if you're still fighting and you never quit, to keep pushing forward. Because my generation is falling, and it is falling fast. It hurts my heart to see the kids that I grew up with, kids I graduated with, Christian school, a lot of my friends. I mean, they are so off the wagon. It is unbelievable. We need all ages to enlist in this fight. It doesn't matter how young you are. If you understand it, you need to enlist. It doesn't matter how old you are, how good you think you are. If you are not serving the way God has intended you to serve, I am recruiting you tonight to put on the whole armor of God. It's not a fleshly fight. It's a spiritual fight. It's a hard fight. We must withstand. And after we have done all to stand, the Bible says, stand therefore. It says it three times within two verses. 
which means God knows it's going to be hard. God knows it's going to get difficult. And I'm telling you, it's starting to get difficult in this world. Our pastor preaches on it very often. Men in this church preach on it very often. It's starting to get difficult. Those of you older people in the faith, if you're getting discouraged, I'm here to tell you there are some of us left that want to push forward for Christ. God tells us to withstand in this fight. Once we have withstood all we can, he tells us again to stand there for, which means when you're getting tired, when you're getting weak, when you're getting weary, look to God. He will help you. He tells us what all we need to put on. I've got a lot to go through, so I'm going to skip down a little bit to verse number uh, 16. Above all, putting on the shield of faith. There's a lot of things I, I, I skipped over that Brother Randy Bain preached on a couple weeks ago. But I feel as if faith is an important one. God tells us above all the things that he has told us to do is to put on the shield of faith. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what does your faith look like? What does your faith in God look like tonight? Is your faith shaken? Is it weary? Does it bend? Is it pliable? Or do you have unshaken faith in God? I'm not talking about just like, oh, well, I kind of trust God. I mean in everything. I mean in everything. Everything that happens, the good and the bad, what does your faith look like? Now, God tells us how we can have faith in God. And I believe that a little on further down in this scripture, in verse number 18, it says, praying always. I believe through prayer comes faith. Our pastor has said this once before, and I believe it wholeheartedly. Satan will fight your prayer life before he fights anything else. Why is that? Because if he diminishes your prayer life, he will completely destroy your spiritual life altogether. Why is that? That's because prayer life is how you talk to God. And I'm not just talking about, Lord, bless this food. Thank you for another day. I'm talking about getting down, talking to God, having a relationship with God, having fellowship with God and knowing the Lord personally. I'm telling you, you will not regret serving in this fight. I'm getting to it. It's a lot to put on. It's a lot to push forward. It gets hard. It gets tiring. But I'm going to explain to you why it's worth it here in a minute. I want to explain something about faith here. Faith, I, I, when I think of faith, I think of Peter in the Bible. And uh, when, he, when he walked on the water, what, what did he have to do in order to walk on the water? He had to have complete faith in God. He stepped out of the boat. But not only did he step out of the boat to walk on the water when he had complete faith in God. I want to point out a few things about that. He not only stepped out of the boat, which was his occupation, may I say. He was a fisherman. That's how he made his living. He not only left his friends in the boat, but his brother was in the boat. Which means Peter was willing to give up all those things to have faith in God. Now, faith becomes hard to have when it means going against someone in your family. When it means going against something that you're so comfortable with. But I'm telling you, faith in God is more important than anything you have faith in in this world. We need to have faith. With prayer comes faith. Satan will attack your prayer life. He will try to diminish your prayer life altogether. Once you pray, once you have faith in God, then you will be able to speak boldly the word of God, which is what we need more than anything. And I don't just mean up on this pulpit. I don't just mean the teachers for VBS. I don't just mean all these things we do here, here at church on Sunday and on Wednesdays. I'm talking about in that world. Out there in your life every day, you need to have prayer, you need to have faith, and you need to be able to fight this fight that I'm talking about. It'll be worth it in the end. We need some people to get on the altar today and say, God, I'm joining this fight. You will not regret joining this fight. Turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter number 45. I'm going to explain to you something pretty great about my God. I serve a perfect God. A God that died on the cross, lived a perfect life, didn't deserve it, suffered and died for me so that I can have salvation. Because in my own flesh, I can do nothing. I can do absolutely nothing in my flesh. It is all in the power of the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Isaiah chapter number 45. When I first started studying this a couple months ago, I was struggling. I was struggling. I was, I was upset and I, was, I didn't know what to do. I decided to go to my Bible And I started reading Isaiah chapter number 45. And the only thing that I even understood from this was that God, the God I serve, is the only God there is. There is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody like Jesus. I want you to look at verse number 3, verse number 5, verse number 6, 14, 18, and 22. He reminds us over and over again in this passage. In verse 3, I am the God of Israel. In verse 5, I am the Lord. There is none else. There is no God beside me. Verse number six, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
Verse number 14 in the latter part. And there is none else. There is no God. Verse number 18. I am the Lord and there is none else. And then verse number 22 in the latter part. I am God. There is none else. Well, if that ain't clear, I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nobody like my Jesus. I want to remind you of something, why you should join this fight. First of all, because Jesus saved you like nobody else could. Jesus saved you in a way that nobody else on this earth could ever save you. I'm talking you have sinned and you deserve hell, my friend. So do I. We all deserve hell. And Jesus passed by my way one day and he saved my soul because I could do nothing in my mind. I could be the best person I could ever try to be on this earth. And I'll tell you, I will never reach heaven. You can do all you want to do in your flesh. You can try to be the best person you want to be. But there is nothing you can do to get you to heaven other than through Jesus Christ. Other than Jesus Christ, our Lord, suffering and dying on the cross. Think of back when you accepted Christ as your Savior. There ain't nobody like Jesus. I I can think and I can remember distinctly the day that I accepted Christ. I was in Indiana. I was at camp. And the preacher preached that morning on Saul turning into Paul and the difference and the change in his life. And I didn't say anything that morning, but that night he preached again. And after the service... He even said, even if this morning's sermon spoke to you, raise your hand. I raised my hand because the Lord had talked to me all day saying, there was no change in you, son. There was no change in you. I did the best I could. I grew up in a Christian home. I I played the part really well. Everyone thought I was saved, but deep in my heart, deep in my soul, I knew that I had not accepted Christ. And I can take you to the place to this day. And I don't know the young man's name who led me to the Lord, but if I saw him in Walmart, I would, I would shake his hand and say, thank you for the day you led me to the Lord because I can remember when Jesus saved me like nobody else can. And I'll tell you something, I did not only walk around with joy that day or that week or that month. Now, this fight gets hard. It gets, it gets up and down. I'm not telling you it's easy, but I'm telling you the person we serve, there ain't nobody like him. He cares for you like nobody else. He knows you like nobody else. He saved you like nobody else ever could. Nobody else ever can. And I'm telling you, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, it is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. Woo! People say, oh, he just has zeal. No, I'm telling you, Jesus saved my soul. He saved me from hell. If God opened the gates of hell for five seconds right there, every one of us would change our life. I promise you, there's something in your life you would change because you would say, whoa, God saved me from that. Jesus saved you like nobody else can. That's one reason we should serve him is because when he passed by your way, he saved you like nobody else can. In verse number two of Isaiah chapter number 45, it begins saying, I will go before thee. I will go before thee. I want you to think about this for a minute. The God who died on the cross. The one who saved your soul from hell promises that he will go before you. And I'll tell you one thing. Your parents can go before you. Your friends can go before you. The people you look up to can go before you. But nobody can go before you the way Jesus can. He knows everything about you. He knows everything you're going to walk into. The people in this world, the people on this earth don't know what God knows. He not only goes before you like nobody else, but he makes the crooked places straight like nobody else i'm telling you when you decide to join this fight when you get down on your face and say god i want to join the fight god i want to re-enlist god i've been called to something that i've ran from and i want to start pushing towards it again jesus is going before you kicking everything that will get in your way he's kicking it out of the way so that you can push forward he can go before you and make the crooked places straight like nobody else. Amen. I'm telling you, one day, one day I came home, I came home from work and I got really bad news. I got some really bad news and I was, I was low. I was feeling sorry for myself. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to go to work the next day. I was feeling sorry for myself and I, I went to my room and I'll never forget it. I, I opened my Bible and I put my face on my Bible. I didn't even read it. I just put my face on my Bible and I started crying. And my tears hit my Bible. And I'm telling you, ever since I've accepted Christ and trusted him, he came into my heart that day and he said, son, I know you by name. 
I know what you're going through. I know your emotions. I know how hard this is. I know what you struggle with. I'm going before you like nobody else. I promise you, I am with you. Nobody can do that like Jesus. The peace that came in my soul that very moment when I started crying and I started saying, God, it doesn't feel like you're with me. He said, think back of the other times you struggled. Think back when you thought, why is my world falling apart? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my family? Why does this, why do these things happen? And he said, son, you accepted me. You trust me. I promise you. I'm going before you like nobody else can. I know what you're struggling with. I know your emotions. You accepted me. I promised you I would never leave you or forsake you. And the peace, the peace that came into my soul that very moment. I started reading Isaiah. I started reading a couple chapters back. And he can make the crooked way straight. And earlier on in this book, in chapter number 43, God tells us how he can even make the wilderness into a desert. He can make the desert into an ocean. He can make an ocean into a desert. God can do things that we can't even think about happening. He knows everything. He can do anything. When you think you've hit your point, look to God. Look to God. There ain't nobody like Jesus. He loves you more than anything in this world. More than anything in this world. You may be thinking right now while I'm preaching, well, something's happening to me and I don't understand it. Talk to God about it. Not on the surface. I mean, talk to God about it. Get down. If you have to cry, cry and say, God, I'm broken. I need you. You promised me you'd go before me. I promise you he'll give you peace. If you fight in this fight, I promise you there ain't nobody like Jesus. He can go before you like nobody else. He can make the crooked ways straight like nobody else. Look in verse number three of Isaiah 45. It says, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches. That's love right there. The treasures in the hidden darkness. In the hidden Darkness. I'm talking about when you can see no way, when it seems like there is no way possible that you are going to get through this. There's no amount of money that can get me out of this. There's no amount of friendship that can get me out of this. There's nothing in this world that can get me out of this. You're right. But Jesus can because there ain't nobody like Jesus. When you choose to decide to say, I'm going to serve Christ no matter what. He is with you every step of the way. And you will not regret it. I promise. There ain't nobody like Jesus. There ain't nobody like Jesus. He saved my soul from hell. I'm telling you, if you're saved, you should be excited. You should be excited. It's not fake. He saved me from hell. He saved my soul from hell. I get to walk on the streets of gold. I don't deserve it. I was a low down piece of nothing. And God said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you from hell because I love you and I care for you. I'm going to go before you like nobody else. I'm going to make the crooked way straight like nobody else. I'm going to make a way when there seems there is no way. We serve that God. He he supplies the treasures in our darkness. That comes with faith, my friend. That comes with faith. You have to have faith in this fight. You have to have faith. One thing I love about my sister My sister was the oldest and I'm the youngest and she beat me and she pretty much helped raise me. And some of the times I didn't deserve it and some of the times I definitely did. But one thing I love about my sister is her husband is in ministry. He's a youth pastor and he serves full time as a youth pastor. And anyone who's in ministry understands this. It's not about the money. It's about the calling. It has nothing to do with the money. I promise you. If, if your preacher or someone in the ministry is in it for the money, then they're not truly called to the ministry. People in the ministry that truly care about the ministry don't care about the money. My sister has anxiety and she struggles with worry. She struggles with not knowing what, what hap- what's going to happen next. She wants to see the next answer. Sometimes when you can't see it, she wants to see it. But every time I talk to her, sometimes she'll ask me to come to her house and I'll go by her house and and she'll be upset. She'll be crying. She's like, I just need to talk to you for a minute. I'm I'm struggling with such and such. And it always has to do with the fact that her husband doesn't make a lot of money and, and they're struggling. But at the end of our conversation, she always ends it with this. But I know that God will provide. 
I know that God will provide. You have to have the faith to know that God will provide all the time. He will provide your treasures in the darkness. You have to serve him and love him and have faith in him in this fight. And he will never let you down. He's the only person who will keep every promise. He's the only person who will lead you the right way. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll never taint your life. He'll never get you hooked on something you shouldn't be hooked on. Jesus loves you like nobody else. Amen. Nobody can love you as deep as Jesus can. He loves everything about you. He loves you. He knows you better than anyone else in this world. We have to have faith to know that Jesus can Supply our treasures in the darkness. He promised us that he will. The fourth point in verse number three is personally my favorite. In the end of verse number three, it says, That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name. Jesus knows your name. He knows my name. Just think about that. Just think about that. The Jesus who came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, didn't deserve it, can be choosing to do anything he wants to do, and he knows your name. He knows everything about you. He said my full name that day I was struggling. I said, God, it doesn't feel like you're with me. He said, Lucas Caleb Hickman, I am here with you right now, right now. And he gave me peace in my soul. He gave me peace in my heart. He knows you by name. Amen. The, tr the journey gets hard. The journey is not easy. I'm not telling you to join this fight and that it's all, oh, hoops and hollers and laughs. No, there are struggles. But I can't help but think going down the road sometimes when I'm thinking, God, why is this happening? Why is this happening right now? Why do I have to go through this? What did I do to deserve this? And sometimes I'm like, God, I don't really want to serve right now. I'm not going to lie. There have been times where I've heard someone said this about me. Well, maybe I shouldn't be preaching. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Sometimes it's a brother in Christ who says, says something about you that, that hurts your feelings and it, and it bothers me and it hurts me. And God said, I never promised you it was going to be easy, friend. I never promised. I didn't say there was no struggle. But I did tell you I'd go before you. I did tell you I'd make the crooked way straight. I did tell you that I'd supply every need you have. And I can't help but think of that song. Of, it's been a long journey, but I have been blessed walking with Jesus. I have no regrets. He is so good to me. I must confess the way has been long, but I'm blessed. Now, it's not just laughs all the time. Now, I've had my share of sunshine and, and rain. I've had days filled with laughter, and I've been on the mountaintop. But I've also had those days filled with pain and sorrow and hurt. And sometimes I watch another brother or sister in Christ hurt, and they're thinking, why, 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 why? Are you thinking that tonight? Are you thinking, why is this happening? Look to Jesus. Look to the Lord. Look to the one who cares about you. Look to the one who, if you serve him, you will not regret it in the end. Amen. This fight is hard and it's difficult. And there's, there's three votes tonight. There's three votes tonight. Let me tell you something. God calls you without repentance. In Romans, God tells us that he calls us without repentance. You, as a Christian that is saved, you are called to something. I don't know what everyone's calling is. I'm not the Lord. I can't tell you that. But the Lord will tell you. And I'm going to tell you something. The Lord knowing you by name can be the biggest blessing or the scariest thing. What do I mean? I mean, God calls you without repentance. It doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter what so-and-so says. It doesn't matter who discourages you. It doesn't matter who says you shouldn't be doing that. If God called you to that, that's what you should be doing. You do not go to men for, for acceptance. You don't go to flesh to say, this is what I need to be doing. No, if God tells you to do it, do it. God is always right. He knows what you should be doing. He calls you without repentance in this fight. When you decide to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you no matter what, he's going to give you, he's going to give you a task. It is a command to serve the Lord. It is a command to share the gospel 
if you're a Christian. It is a command. It's not a choice. God has called you to something. You choose to accept your calling or not. God calls you without repentance. He knows everything you'll need. He knows everything you'll worry about. He knows the call that he's given you and he will lead you through it. But there are three votes when it comes to what God's called you to do. There's you, there's God the Father, and there's Satan. Jesus is for you. Satan is against you. You are the final vote. You are the final vote in this, in this scenario, in this life, in what's actually happening. God has called you to something. Satan is discouraging you, telling you no, putting obstacles in your way, saying don't do it. You are the deciding vote to say, I'm going to serve God with what he's commanded me to do or I'm not going to. Satan is very good at convincing you to say no. He's very good at convincing you not to follow what God has called you to do. It could be a number of things. God could have called you to do something that I couldn't even think of. It could be running a bus route. It could be preaching the word of God. It could be a prayer warrior. Growing up, the church I went to, there was a man who showed up to the church hours early, and it was a smaller church than this, and he walked down the aisles, he put his hand on every pew, he knew who sat on that pew, and he prayed for each and every person. That was his calling. God called him without repentance to be the prayer warrior that he was. Amen. God has called you to something. It may be as simple as getting down and praying and getting a hold of God for other people, for the church, for your friends, bear each other's burdens. Or it may be something bigger. You may be called to preach and you haven't accepted it. You may be called to be helping in some way and you haven't accepted it. You may be called to wash the toilet. Accept your calling from Christ. I don't know what it is, but God does. He calls you without repentance. You are the deciding vote within the three. There's God, Satan, and you. God's for you. Satan's against you. You're the, you're the deciding vote. Now, I want you to picture yourself. This is what's going to happen. It may not look exactly like this, but in theory, this is what's going to happen. When you die, you're going to go to judgment. And God, the perfect, righteous judge, is going to judge you. And he's perfect, and he is righteous, and he knows everything you've done. He knows when you watched pornography. He knows when you cheated on your spouse. He knows when you lied. He knows every intention in your head. He knows every intention in your heart. He knows when the whole world thinks, oh, look how good that person is, and your intentions are as evil as Satan. He knows your intentions. He knows everything. Satan's going to be there, though. It's going to be you, God the Father, and Satan. Satan's going to be saying, he did this. He did that. He did this. He did that. She did this. She did that. She did this. She did that. And you're probably thinking in your head right now, whoa, I would hate for my, my life to be played up on a screen up here. Because everyone in this room would see what you've done wrong. They would see all your sin. Satan's going to be naming them off. He's going to know them. He's the one who tempted you to do them. And God the Father is a perfect judge. So I hate to break it to you, friend. You're guilty. And God the Father is a perfect judge. And you're guilty. But I'm going to tell you. Remember when I said there ain't nobody like Jesus? Because that's when Jesus walks in and says, the debt has been paid. Now you're going to have two reactions. You're going to have two reactions at that moment. You're going to be sitting there thinking, I did that. God, I did that. I'm sorry. God, I did that. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to go to hell. You're going to feel the flames. You're going to be thinking, I, I didn't serve God the way I should. Or when God walks in, you're going to say, I knew it. I knew Jesus was going to walk through the door and he was going to say, your debt has been paid. And he's going to show his perfect, righteous blood that he shed on the cross. And he's going to say, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't serve God with what he's commanded you to do at that moment, you are going to be scared that you're going to hell. You're going to be scared you're going to hell because you will know in your soul that you were called to do something that you decided not to do. You decided to say, I ain't going to do it when Jesus called you to that. So I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nobody like Jesus that's going to walk through that back door and say, I paid the debt he could not pay. And I paid it in full. And he did. And he's perfect and he's gracious and he's good like that. But in order to have the confidence at that very moment to say, 
I don't need you, Satan. Jesus promised me that he would come in. Jesus promised me that I would be in heaven with him one day. The only way you're going to have that true confidence is if you join the fight and you say, God, no matter what it is, the sin in my life, the besetting sin that I carry around day to day, I'm throwing it out. Whatever it is, that guilt that sets in after I do it because I know I shouldn't be doing it, I'm going to lay it at the altar and I'm going to say, God, I'm re-enlisting in the fight or maybe you're joining today or maybe you're just coming up to say, God, I'm going to push forward because there ain't nobody like you. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to be more than glad that I decided to serve you no matter what. No matter who discourages you, no matter who says what, no matter what happens, no matter how hard it gets, Jesus goes before you like nobody else. There ain't nobody like Jesus. It is worth serving our perfect Savior. I promise you that. Please, please, I, I beg you. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. My generation is falling apart. It's not just us younger people that need to step up and join this fight. Some of the older people need to re-enlist. Some of the men need to re-enlist. Some of the women need to re-enlist. Some of y'all need to encourage us. Some of y'all need to say, you know what? We're going to join this fight again. We're going to help you out. We're not just going to let you drop and fall. You have to have some compassion for us. You have to have some compassion. You can't look at a, at a young Christian and say, oh, well, you made a mistake. No, you got to pull them up. You got to have some compassion. We're going to make mistakes. I don't say everything perfectly. I've said things behind this pulpit that probably weren't even biblically correct. I'm not perfect, but I'm telling you something. I'm trying to serve the perfect God. And it, you will not regret serving Jesus Christ. There ain't nobody like Jesus. I promise you that. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for another day of life. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach. This evening, God, I pray that you would fill this building with the power of your Holy Spirit. If there's anyone who needs to decide to say, God, I'm going to join this fight. I'm going to put away that, that, that sin that I carry around with me all the time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on the altar. And I'm going to say, God, I need you. I want to join the fight. There ain't nobody like you. I'm going to follow you. God, if anyone in here is hurting and, and is struggling and is in that darkness right now, I pray that you would come down and say, I'm with you. I'm with you, sister. I'm with you, son. I'm with you, daughter. I know you by name and I love you and I care for you. Please, Lord, touch the hearts and the souls in this building that are struggling and are hurting. Thank you for everything you've given me. Thank you for this opportunity. You're perfect. You're wonderful. I pray that we praise you for it each and every day of our lives. Lord, please be with Vacation Bible School this upcoming week. All the hard work that has been put into getting that together. Some of these women and men have put so much time and effort. God, I pray that you would fill this entire piece of property with the power of the Holy Spirit so that these kids can get a foundation instilled in them. I thank you for everything that you've given me, God. It's in your sense perfect and precious name, I pray. Amen.